discussion on active microwave remote sensing. In the previous discussion, we have had some points related with uh, microwave remote sensing in part 1. Now, we are going to have a little more detailed discussion on microwave remote sensing, especially related with errors which are associated uh, with the data sets of uh, microwave or radar data. And this is uh, uh, the one error which is uh, one cause or one uh, condition in microwave remote sensing is that it is not uh, nadir viewing remote sensing, it is oblique or slant uh, remote sensing. And therefore, uh, if, we, if uh, the sensors are looking sideways, then there will be some problems especially associated with hilly terrain. And this is what the we put in the category that is a slant range and distortion. If we see here that uh, this is the sensor and uh, when the pulse is sent, uh, there are uh, a terrain is also shown here. This is the terrain and if there is a hill, then uh, first of all, there will be a problem about the shadow because one side of the hill is illuminated whereas other side is not illuminated and that will go in the shadow and when we see these data sets or images microwave power images we will not see the this part of the uh, hill so that goes in the shadow as soon as a dark thick line uh, whereas um, there will be two more uh, problems associated in hilly terrains of microwave data uh, one is force shortening, another one is the layover and these will also bring distortions especially in hilly terrain. So, these, uh, these things uh, which we will be uh, discussing in detail also and uh, uh, you know that uh, height uh, sometimes uh, which is uh, measured and this is the geoid surface which is a geophysical surface surface estimated and whereas the real terrain is shown as the top layer here and in, in here you are having the ellipsoid which is a mathematical surface. So, height uh, when it is calculated uh, using uh, radar data especially in the SAR interferometry technique where we prepare digital elevation models these things uh, these distortions that means the slant range distortions uh, will play very important role. One thing uh, we have to remember that uh, these uh, uh, the objects which are closest to the sensor are called near range uh, and whereas uh, the objects which are far are also they called as far range objects because uh, generally in the center uh, we take the mid range, mid slant range. So, anything which is uh, is very far from the center is put as a far range otherwise it is in the near range. So, the slant range distortions occur because the radar is measuring the distance to feature or ground object in slant range rather than the true horizontal distance along the ground. So, it is not measuring neither vertical distance or not horizontal distance what it is measuring the slant range and uh, distance and that is why uh, this problem arises. And the, uh, the result of this slant range distortion is uh, vary with the scale, image scale and especially moving from uh, you know near to far range or moving from center to away or margins of the data set. So, this uh, is a varying as per the scale goes or within the scene. Now, these slant range distortions, uh, two distortions the uh, force shortening and layover. So, first we take uh, force shortening and uh, when it occurs uh, when radar beam reaches the base, uh, base of a mountain or tall feature. Uh, and the result is that uh, it is uh, you feel that it is tilted towards the raja, uh, radar or the sensor uh, uh, that is example the best example 
here in case of a mountain situation. So, this is a kind of displacement which we see uh, uh, which will bring uh, this feature in the image is a sort in size or in length rather than the real, uh, real thing and that is what we say is the foreshortening. For example, here uh, we, we will be this part will get a very small register and uh, registration in the image only up to this much. So, that means that uh, this, if I take the center of uh, uh, center of uh, this image, then, then I get only, only this part recorded here in the image, not the entire length of this mountain. So, this much part will go, will be considered in foreshortening and so this, this kind of displacement in the image is there that means that foreshortening occurs when the radar beam or pulse reaches the base of a tall feature tilted towards the radar but which reaches before basically the top. So, the radar beam will reach first here because this is having far distance it will reach later. So, this will register first and therefore, the feature will appear shorter here. Same thing here also is explained that uh, if I if I take these two points and plot here A dash B dash. So, instead of having this kind of length which is should be uh, A B, it is getting A dash B dash and A dash B dash is definitely short of uh, line A B. Uh, whereas, on the other side uh, I am getting B C. So, A B equal to B C. I also get registered B dash C dash which is equal to again B C or A B. So, in one, uh, one slope of the hill is recorded sort and that too in the front direction. So, that is why it is called foreshortening. This is a very common error of uh, images or data radar data of hilly terrain. And if we see in the real images this is what uh, we see and uh, therefore, the usage of such images or interpretation use uh, of these images including analysis becomes very, very difficult. Sometimes uh, 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 images of uh, hilly terrain like Himalaya highly rugged terrain when we acquire or when we see these radar data especially the power image this is what we see and then interpretation becomes very, very difficult. One, one slope is getting fully illuminated, other slope is not getting illumination, it goes completely in shadow, one. Second is the base of the uh, mountain or hill is getting recorded first, whereas top of the mountain is getting recorded later. And this in this situation, the slope gets a very less recording in the data and therefore, uh, less compared to the real one and therefore, it appears in the and uh, the images will appear like this and this phenomena uh, we call as foreshortening. Now, there is another associated phenomena again in the hilly regions and that is the layover phenomena. So, it occurs uh, when the radar beam reaches the top of a tall feature or a hill before it reaches the base because there might be a situation because uh, this all these distortions are being caused because of slant range and, uh, and the radar is looking sideways oblique direction and a situation may come when top of the mountain is getting uh, recorded first then the base of the mountain. So, it is just reverse of your foreshortening and this will bring uh, as you can see here that A B is uh, uh, here. Uh, B is getting recorded first as you can see here A is getting recorded later. So, it is a layover and uh, that means it will create a problem in the data set and uh, though the distance between B and C here B and C will remain same, but uh, the distance between A and B gets reversed the return signal or the back scattering from the top of the feature or top of the mountain hill will be received before 
the signal from the bottom. It's just reverse of force shortening. And the result of this would be that the top of the feature displaced towards the radar or the sensor from its true position on the ground and therefore lay over uh, the base of the feature that is B dash to A dash. And this will create a, a again distortions in the image, slant range we put in under the category of slant range distortion and the images might look like this. These are the near range, here you are having the far range and uh, this the situation affect uh, due to the layover which is dominating in the near and far range parts of this image of the mountain areas. So that uh, the challenge basically with radar remote sensing, active microwave remote sensing is in hilly terrain. Because of undulations or ruggedness, if it is like um, Himalayan mountain system, then the slant range distortions namely your layover and force shortening will really dominate and then processing analysis and interpretation of such images becomes very difficult. Now let us see some more uh, uh, other slant range distortions, shadow I mentioned earlier that shadowing effect uh, which will increase uh, with the greater incident angle and uh, uh, here the incident angle is shown as phi and just as our shadow lengthen uh, as the sun sets as in case of our uh, normal remote sensing. So here if illumination is coming from this direction then uh, this is the uh, basically we say as a wave front. So this part is getting illuminated of hill without any problem whereas this part of the hill the other side of the slope is going completely in the shadow and therefore it will bring distortions in the images as you can see here that in this uh, folded uh, sandstone beds of uh, Malaysia this part is getting completely in shadow and we do not get any information whatsoever of this region and that may create a problem in our analysis. So, shadow will also occur in a hilly region. If I compare with a flat terrain like Indo-Gangetic plain or maybe some desert areas, layover force shortening or shadows issue might not be there at all. And if they are there, they will be very minor and therefore, uh, radar remote sensing, active remote sensing uh, can be very useful in such situations. But uh, especially in hilly terrain, it is challenging to use. Now we use uh, the term SAR which is synthetic aperture radar. Uh, basically a radar is synthesized in space because in space we can not have a large antenna and therefore uh, this uh, concept is used that uh, digital images uh, uh, of SAR image that is synthetic aperture radar image uh, can be seen as a mosaic. And for example, a two dimensional array formed by columns and rows as in normal raster data or normal images of small picture elements for example, pixels and each these pixels are associated with a small area of earth surface and that is called resolution cell or a spatial resolution. So, these cells would be in a square in shape and they would be representing a part of the earth. Uh, that may be uh, 10 meter by 10 meter, 30 meter by 30 meter like that. So, these SAR images this is how they are uh, created and each pixel gives a complex number. This is very important in case of radar remote sensing because uh, in normal remote sensing like in passive remote sensing, uh, visible infrared, thermal infrared where the uh, pixel value is just representing either reflection or emission from a part of the surface ground. Whereas in case of a SAR image, radar image, this uh, the cell is representing a complex number and that complex number is carrying basically the amplitude of the wave 
and the phase information of that wave uh, which has recorded that cell. So, this, uh, 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 this complex number is made of, of amplitude and phase information uh, about the microwave field by that is back scattered by uh, different scatterers, different objects. For example, there might be bare rocks, there might be vegetation, there might be built up areas like buildings, any object, uh, natural objects or man made objects which are present on the ground uh, will have their different behavior in terms of uh, their back scattered in the microwave field. So, basically what we are recording in complex number as amplitude and phase information. One application which is SAR interferometry in which we exploit the phase difference. This phase information is exploited and the phase difference between two images of the same area taken on two different dates are analyzed and we get the change which has occurred between these two dates. So, this uh, that thing information is acquired through phase differences. Now, uh, different rows uh, because there are columns in, in any raster image if we see in form of raster then there will be columns and rows. So, different rows of SAR images are associated with different azimuth location because we are recording the data not in nadir viewing but slant range. So, therefore, they will be representing different angle that is azimuth location whereas, different columns will indicate the different slant range locations. That is why uh, it is said as a complex number and these not only the cell represents uh, the amplitude and phase information, but these rows and columns also represent and uh, the rows represents basically azimuth information or azimuth location whereas, different columns will represent slant range, slant range locations. And the, the radiation uh, which is transmitted from the radar which reaches to the earth or is scattered or objects of the ground and then come back to radar in, in the form of SAR images or two way travel. So, it records uh, these two things. Now, scatterers of different distances from radar because on the ground things are located may be differently and uh, that is different slant ranges introduce uh, different delays between transmission and recession of the radiation because each object or a scatterer will behave differently and therefore, there might be delays if there is a water body or is the vegetation or a bare soil all will behave differently all will send different signals. So, if we see in this sense uh, what we see basically here uh, that uh, uh, the data is the of course, it is in the wave form and uh, uh, one two peaks of this wave we, we associate with the wavelength uh, lambda and uh, one whole cycle we consider as a uh, 2 pi here. So, if, uh, if we see that uh, when it completes uh, uh, one, uh, one cycle that is one wavelength and uh, this uh, will be our phase. So, as you can see that the phase is uh, here is denoted here as 2 phi and, and 2 pi and uh, this is the phase information. So, in SAR interferometry what is done is a uh, half the half the wavelength. So, that half uh, part of this uh, uh, is uh, uh, analyzed half the wavelength is basically multiplied with the uh, and the number of fringes which we get which we will be having a separate discussion, but I want to link this uh, figure with uh, SAR interferometry now also. So, which by which we get the phase differences recorded. Now, you see that the phi here is 2 pi that is whole divided by wavelength and then we, we say that uh, 2 r equal to 4 pi. Um, uh, divided by wavelength multiply by r. 
So, in that way we get we, we can have 4 pi here lambda and then r. So, this way also phi can be uh, calculated that phi becomes equal to 4 pi upon lambda by multiply by r. So, this is of course, a sensoroidal signal your uh, wave and uh, 2 v distance. So, this v reaches at this stage by 2 r and uh, 2 uh, pi is shown here and uh, of course, half the wavelength. So, half the wavelength uh, we can also have the phase here. So, due to almost uh, purely sensoroidal nature of a uh, transmitted signal and uh, this delay tau is equivalent to phase change that is phi between transmitted and received signals and the phase change is thus proportional to 2 base travel distance that is 2 r. That is why in uh, previous uh, equation we have used uh, 2 r. So, the 2 r of radiation basically divided by transmitted wavelength because the range has to travel twice that is why 2 r is taken. In other words, the phase of SAR uh, signal is a measure of just the last fraction of 2 way travel distance that is smaller than the transmitted wavelength. So, this uh, is also important here that the SAR signal is major of just the last fraction of 2 way travel distance that is smaller than the transmit wavelength. In case of a real aperture radar, so we compare here what basically the difference between real aperture and synthetic aperture. The real aperture radar uses a antenna of the maximum practical length to produce a narrow angular beam width in the azimuth direction. One thing you have to always remember while using the inter, uh, radar data or analyzing or interpreting the data that this data is a slant range data or collected in oblique direction. And therefore, all these uh, intricacies which I am discussing are all associated because of slant range or oblique direction uh, data not neither. So, because it has to collect the back scattering and how it will collect the back scattering when it has interacted the pulse or signals or microwave which has interacted with the objects on the ground. Then in order to collect that signal you need either a, a, a big antenna or which can have which can produce the narrow angular beam width in the azimuth direction. And in a synthetic aperture radar, that is a coherent side looking airborne system which uses the flight path of the aircraft to simulate an extremely large antenna. So, using this uh, uh, you know side looking airborne system in a coherent manner it simulates basically it does not have the large antenna in case of like in real aperture radar because uh, having a large antenna on a, a spacecraft is very very difficult. So, that is why the synthetic aperture has been thought and it is being used now regularly. So, in this uh, side looking airborne system or a space borne system a currently a uh, antenna is simulated and it is a large antenna is simulated and or we also say aperture electronically and that generates a high resolution remote sensing images. So, uh, in real sense the spacecraft does not is not carrying a large antenna, but because of this side looking airborne uh, system a, uh, having a coherency there or a synchronization a large antenna can be simulated and therefore, it is possible to collect or generate high resolution high spatial resolution remote sensing images using active microwave technique. So, this is 
the difference. In real aperture radar, the real large antenna is taken by the spacecraft, whereas in synthetic aperture radar, a normal size antenna is taken, but a large antenna is synthesized. You exploiting this side looking airborne or space borne system. So, the signal processing basically when this back scattering is happening uses magnitude and phase of the received signals over successive pulses from elements of a synthetic aperture radar. So, this is what happens that uh, these two magnitude of the wave and the phase that is uh, received over the successive pulses because the antenna or the spacecraft uh, is continuously sending successive energy or pulses and uh, whatever you are getting back is scattered that is what it is recorded. So, this uh, uses uh, enduring signal processing of the back scattered or received signals this uh, magnitude and phase are uh, recorded in a manner that uh, we exploit uh, this uh, uh, SR or SAR that is synthetic aperture. So, after a given number of cycles as in earlier figure we have seen that the stored data is recombined taking into account the Doppler effects inherent in different transmitted to the target geometry in each succeeding cycle to create a high resolution image of the terrain being overflown. So, using the Doppler effect also a high resolution images can be generated using this synthetic aperture radar technology. So, currently most of the uh, microwave remote sensing satellites uses this SAR technology. Now, the one of the best uh, example of uh, this uh, uh, SAR technology which was used in a very special mission which is called shuttle radar topographic mission. But in this one because uh, we wanted or the, uh, the mission wanted that uh, to create a digital elevation model for almost entire globe except for polar regions. So, this mission was launched in February 2000 only for 11 days to take the orbits different orbits of the earth and instead of SAR a real aperture means a real aperture technology was used and uh, the baseline difference was maintained of about uh, see this 20 uh, 197 foot long mast this was here which was used with this uh, subtle uh, radar and uh, with a 28 feet receiver the biggest such object ever deployed in space. The purpose here was that at the same time a terrain or a part of the terrain part of the ground should be looked with two different angles basically. And that is why you are seeing here that uh, one was uh, looked from this angle and another one was looked from a different angle using this 197 feet, uh, uh, feet long mast and that gave a fixed baseline. So, one angle was from here of course, this was also in slant range and another one was also there 197 uh, feet away and this allowed to collect the data coherently. And uh, because if uh, there is a uh, fixed baseline therefore, it, is, it becomes very easy to create coherent images and if uh, coherent images can be created then it becomes very easy to use such data sets to create digital elevation models. 
because at the same time with the two different slant ranges the data was being collected having a fixed baseline difference between the two uh, slant ranges and that allowed to create digital elevation model even in the real aperture setup for almost entire globe except for polar regions and the data which was then analyzed and digital elevation model at different resolutions were created initially the digital elevation models created by this synthetic aperture and this uh, subtle topographic mission or in short we say uh, srtm initially uh, digital elevation model we are launched at 1 km resolution later on on 90 m resolution and then further processing allowed us to have digital elevation models from srtm at 30 m resolution for entire globe and uh, that gave a completely new uh, not only the insight in the microwave remote sensing or active microwave remote sensing but uh, lot of uh, applications we had then developed using such uh, uh, data sets that means the uh, digital elevation models and one of the products which we see or use use that is uh, and this uh, google earth in in the background where when we get the elevation values from google earth those elevation values are coming from srtm and uh, digital elevation models which are in the background or uh, behind those satellite images so uh, srtm uh, first time could produce a global digital elevation model even up to 30 meter having this kind of arrangement which which was a two slant ranges simultaneously data collected having a fixed baseline difference otherwise what happens if baseline changes the entire strategy of processing in sar interferometry will also change and for individual scenes this uh, thing has to be created whereas in case of srtm all the things were fixed so therefore it became very easy to dig develop digital elevation models this is what happens uh, exactly in the synthetic aperture radar that uh, once the data is transmitted by a sensor towards the earth and uh, then as soon as the spacecraft or aircraft moves whatever the back scattering is coming it collects and therefore it simulates a large antenna in space basically and uh, that is why it is called synthetic aperture radar so a large antenna using uh, the uh, using the uh, side looking airborne system it is possible to create a large antenna and uh, uh, data can be acquired so here again that a uh, synthetic aperture radar data collection is there the uh, you know that uh, transmission happens and then it uh, this is the start of uh, this is the start of synthetic aperture radar data collection this is the end of aperture data collection and it uh, goes on continuously for uh, you know the earlier pulse a uh, data has been sent and collected whereas for the next pulse again data has been sent and collected instead of having a large antenna on the spacecraft a because of the movement of the satellite and side looking movement allows us to have a, 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 a simulated antenna and this is what it happens so in a, in a, this a, a, a synthetic aperture radar or in sar systems are coherent see in a, whenever we want to use a, a, not power images which also have got some applications which we will be seeing but when we want to use them in in interferometry like for example creating digital elevation models or in change detection studies especially uh, measuring or estimating ground deformations then coherency is very much required between two scenes having the same uh, uh, side looking angle 
and a slant range, but maybe on two different dates in order to detect the changes. But the coherency is required so that the rest of the changes are not there except the changes which might have caused because of some movement of the ground. And therefore, and, and this uh, non-coherency can occur due to the climatic conditions, especially maybe changes in the vegetation or in the built up areas and so on and so forth. So, SAR systems are coherent that is capable of recording both amplitude and phase values. And in SAR interferometry, we basically exploit the phase differences. Therefore, a focused SAR image is a complex value matrix and its amplitude is a map of microwave ground reflectivity of the sensed data or sensed area and we call as a power image also. Such images which are, which are representing the amplitude or reflectivity from the ground or back scattered. So, on the other hand what we can say that the SAR phase depends basically both on the local reflectivity from the objects and the sensor target distance. If sensor target distance is too large, then we may not get that kind of reflection. There will be some energy loss in between. Now, the phase data which is sensitive to sensor target distance is extremely high and two-way path difference of lambda that is wavelength is a single wave path difference of 0.5 or half the lambda. So, if, uh, uh, that if I say that uh, 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 there is a uh, uh, like uh, 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 this uh, ERS or radar set and uh, they are having wavelength of uh, 5.6 uh, centimeter, then the half the wavelength would be uh, 2.83 centimeter and that is true in case of ERS and radar set. And uh, that basically transfer translates into a full phase cycle of 2 pi. So, half the wavelength will be as one fringe in INSAR images. So, as different bands are used by different sensors, example here of uh, ERS and radar set in which a uh, uh, band is uh, having the wavelength is having 5.6 roughly and uh, therefore, uh, this uh, the phase difference or path difference would be half, half of the wavelength and uh, we end up with 2.83. So, one fringe in an interferometry image would be equal to 2.83 centimeter. So, if I am getting 10 fringes which I can count or I can employ the system to count and these fringes multiply by the half the wavelength that much of uh, uh, deformation I can say very well that this much of deformation has occurred. So, number of fringes multiply by half of the wavelength in which the uh, data has been acquired. I, ERS and radar set example is given here and that will give me uh, uh, the, num uh, the total deformation has taken place. That deformation might be due to an earthquake, might be due to an over exploitation of groundwater subsidence in case of mining, nature uh, landslides or any other reason may be there. So, that is why uh, very accurately and uh, these uh, uh, deformations can be measured, can be estimated using uh, active microwave remote sensing. So, this uh, brings to end of uh, this discussion. In next discussion of course, we will be more focusing on uh, SAR interferometry, how it works, what are the intricacies in uh, SAR interferometry and then we will also see uh, uh, the applications of. But before that, we will be also looking these ERS images uh, or uh, SAR images uh, which are power images rather than interferometry 
and we will see that how these can be uh, applied or use can be used for different applications. So, this brings to end of this uh, discussion. Thank you very much.